Well, here we are again, washing guitars. This time we're going to be speaking about Hamer, in particular the early days. To set the scene a little bit, it's the 1970s and it's sort of a small fraternity of guitar geeks such as myself that had decided that the big guys were not producing guitars in those days that were as appropriate as we thought they should be. And some people took action on this, notably Bernard Rico with B.C. Rich and, and Grover Jackson with Jackson Charvel, uh, uh, Dean Selinsky with Dean Guitars. And the first really was uh, Paul Hamer and Joel Danzig with Hamer guitars, though there weren't Hamer guitars in the first place. They had a music store in, outside of Chicago called Northern Prairie that did repair and refinishing and sold used guitars. Used guitars in those days were not considered vintage guitars yet. As, as a frame of reference, I recently found a bill from 1974 from a notable guitar dealer friend of mine in St. Louis for four instruments, a single cut junior, a double cut junior, a reverse Firebird one, and a 63 Esquire, and the total for the four of them was $825. Now, in 1974, 800 was a lot of money, and of course, none of us had any money at the time. We used to call it spent the rent, but when you're talking food, housing, or a guitar, there's really not much choice. In any event, uh, Hamer and Danzig decided that they could perhaps build an instrument better than what the big guys were, make it a more personalized, hands-on type construction. And by way of that, their first, they did a, f a few flying V's, custom flying V's, but decided on the Explorer silhouette like this. Um, and it's sort of a hybrid uh, Explorer Les Paul SG in that it's a Honduras mahogany body, one piece, mahogany neck, rosewood fingerboard, the two-piece top is actually veneer. It's not a solid top. They just wanted it to look classy. Um, two humbuckers, a control setup not unlike the original Explorer, where you have a volume, a volume, and a master tone control pickup selector switch. The um, very first ones, according to them, maybe 10, actually had original Gibson PAFs in them. But they hooked up with Larry DiMarzio, who was trying to get his business off the ground at the time. And he started prototyping pickups for them. And they ultimately decided on a custom version of his PAF. And the one that they decided on had a slightly hotter bridge pickup and a slightly rolled back bass neck pickup. Uh, ironically, they apparently used up all the prototypes that were sent because of money constraints. They also, in the early days, most of them came with Grover tuners, um, but Grover was not yet making a six on a side set, so they bought regular three on a side type sets and used half of them for one guitar and the other half of them for another guitar. So some of them are out there with backwards tuners on them. But again, you live and learn. Ultimately, they switched over to Schaller. Um, but the idea was to create an instrument that was custom made and tailored to the, uh, to the, uh, person who was going to be playing the instrument. They attracted enough attention that they eventually had Martin Barr from Jethro Tull and Mick Ralphs from Bad Company and uh, Andy Summers from The Police and of course uh, Rick Nielsen from Cheap 
Prick, who was probably the best known proponent of the guitar, maybe because his band was nearby in Illinois. Um, but they did a very limited production between 1975 and 78. They made maybe 50 by their estimate. And 76 to 79, when Gibson did their first Explorer reissue, they shipped around 3,300. So you see the juxtaposition in the, uh, the production abilities. But these early ones were originally called the Hamer guitar because they weren't even sure that it was going to go any farther than maybe 20 instruments, but it got popular enough that they expanded the in a in a fit of Herculean modesty. Their very first ads referred to them as the ultimate guitar, new or old. That's pretty brave. You got to love this arrogance. It's 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 so American, um, but. By 1978, the store was gone. They had opened up a manufacturing facility in Arlington uh, Heights, Illinois, and were off and running, launching their second model, which they called the Sunburst. Um, and it was the first and many that followed. And it was at that point that this was no longer called the Hamer guitar, it was called the Standard, just so it, it didn't get confused. Uh, they become rather sought after, these early ones. These are both what they call four-digit Hamers, referring to the low serial numbers. And uh, they're, they're extremely cool guitars. The DiMarzios sound great. They also wound up with with all of them in stock condition are a double cream and a zebra. They always did it that way. You'll see exceptions on very early ones, but for the most part, that's what they went with. Uh, one of the curiosities, I don't know if you folks have noticed in recent years, but none of the manufacturers are doing, it's either double black or zebra, because Larry DiMarzio, rascal that he is apparently somewhere along the line, copyrighted double cream, so they can't really have them unless somebody's sneaking it by. Um, but the, the courage of taking on a project like this, in 1975 the guitar cost essentially $800, which was more expensive than a Les Paul Custom at the time. And within two years or so, they were about $1,200, which was a lot of money back then. But you got a lot of guitar for it because it was mostly handmade for the most part. But um, ultimate, that's a matter of opinion, but they're certainly cool. Um, as a sidebar, my old alma mater, Grayson's Music, was the first New York dealer for these way back in the day. Um, and we had an early customer, a hotshot guitar kid named Tommy Coletti, who would come in and dazzle us with his brilliance on guitar. And he's a nice kid, and we always had a good time. And he liked coming there so much that if you flash forward, because Mr. Grayson, when he incorporated his business, changed it to Grayson's Music Zoo, which is now long defunct, but that was the name Tommy took to name his own business. And here we are in 2018 with the Music Zoo and cool hamers and cool guitars everywhere. Um, I would say that if you get the opportunity, these are well worth checking out because they have a feel, a handmade feel, that's hard to find in 70s instruments, but you gotta be the judge of that. In the meantime, rock on.
I've been thinking that for future discussion, we're going to talk about um, the guitar syndrome as an illness, and I also want to talk about the rights and wrongs that I see in new and old guitars, if that's of interest. Um, and Walter, my producer, also suggested we do a piece that he's calling uh, Piping Plovers at the Beach are our friends, but I, I think he'll have to speak to me about that. But in the meantime, it's always your next move. <laughs>